All right, so welcome. Thank you all for coming uh, to, I guess this is a teaching on laborism and the labor party, so to speak. There's a long and complicated relationship between the British Labor Party and the various parties to its left. Um, so this is Marxist revolutionary parties like the Socialist Workers Party or the IMT, to you know, small sects with a handful of members and various radical academics. Labor is variously seen as a vehicle for anti-Toryism, an opportunity to advance socialism through the British state, the voice and political expression of the working class, or a barrier to properly socialist emancipatory politics. Whether it is any of these things, and what it means to the Marxist left as a whole, is the subject of this talk. So I just first to uh, define socialism for our purposes because it is often a contested, misunderstood term, not least within the Labour Party itself. And so by socialism, I mean the overcoming of capitalism and the transformation of labour and society. So transforming labour from a necessity to a want and building a society where, in the words of uh, the phrase from Louis Blanc made more famous by Karl Marx, from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. And so any consideration of labor has to begin with this history. Labor is very inward looking in this regards. So their origins are in the British trade union movement, which since the dissolution of the Chartists in the late 1840s, has sought to improve the conditions of its members within the context of existing capitalism. 19th century British trade unionists sought to influence the late Liberal Party and the Trade Union Congress, or TUC, was founded in 1869 in an attempt to pressure the Labour Liberal Party into reformist legislation. And so unlike the German Social Democrats, Labour's origins are not as a Marxist party or even as a party with a significant Marxist wing. The organizations that eventually founded the Labour Party coalesced together, the Fabian Society, the TUC, um, various other trade unions were explicitly non-Marxist or even anti-Marxist socialists opposed the revolutionary politics and believing in the inevitability of gradualism, as Fabian Sidney Webb described it. And so Labour's commitment, or lack thereof, to some form of socialism is encapsulated in Clause 4 of the party's constitution. The original version, written by Sidney Webb, goes as follows. To secure for the workers by hand or by brain the full fruits of their industry and the most equitable distribution thereof that may be possible upon the basis of the common ownership of the means of production, distribution, and exchange, and the best obtainable system of popular administration and control of each industry or service. And so Clause 4 was, attempt, it was attempted to change Clause 4 in the 1950s, um, and that failed, and so it was eventually changed in 1995 by Tony Blair. And the short version of Tony Blair's Clause 4, which is print in the back of Labour Party membership cards is, the Labour Party is a democratic socialist party. It believes that by the strength of our common endeavour, we achieve more than we achieve alone, so as to create for each of us the means to realise our true potential, and for all of us a community in which power, wealth, and opportunity are in the hands of the many, not the few, where the rights we enjoy reflect the duties we owe, and where we live together freely in a spirit of solidarity tolerance, and respect. Neither of those are particularly meaningful, but the second one seems to be a little bit even more devoid of any particular socialist content. And so a substantial portion of the British left wants Labour to return to the old Clause 4 on the basis that this will restore the party to its alleged former state as a socialist party. However, the old Clause 4, and this has been pointed out by a variety of critics of this, um, uh, specifically in this case, I'm thinking of Jack Conrad, who has written several times about uh, Clause 4 and the hopelessness of attempts to restore the old Clause 4. The old Clause 4 is a specifically anti-Marxist platform of state capitalist nationalization, drafted in response to the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 in the hope that such an uprising would not happen here. Moreover, there is nothing particularly socialist about nationalizing major industries. From its outset, the Labour Party has been opposed to revolutionary politics of any kind, preferring the state-led noblesse oblige of the welfare state to, uh, to deep societal transformation, championing nationalization and scientific management against the dictatorship of the proletariat. The Labour Party is a Bonapartist party, using the state in an attempt to manage and suppress social discontents. 
labor's bonapartism takes a particularly state capitalist form. For instance, they're currently promising to nationalize railway services and stop the privatization of the NHS, whatever exactly that means. And so much of the left's relationship with the Labour Party has been through entryism, through attempting to join the party and transform it or drag its positions to the left. And they not only failed to move the party towards a more radical socialist position, but they've managed to reinforce the party's general anti-Marxism. The most successful entryist project was Militant. The name comes from their paper, their official name was the Revolutionary Socialist League, who began participating in the Labour Party in the 1960s, and under the, leader of, under the leadership of Ted Grant, managed to build a substantial base within the party and acquired sympathizers from elsewhere on Labour's left, including at one point Jeremy Corbyn. And even those on the left critical of the Labour Party, people like Ian Burchill, have acknowledged the accomplishment of the militant project in infiltrating labor. The militant is a very peculiar organization. Michael Crick, who's a Channel 4 journalist who quite literally wrote the book on militant, described them as influenced by Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Trotsky, and virtually nobody else. And they're led by Ted Grant, as I said, an enigmatic South African who spent his entire political life declaring that the collapse of capitalism was imminent. And militants survived Labour's anti-communist disciplinary measures in the 1960s because unlike the Socialist Workers' Party led by Tony Cliff or Jerry Healy's Workers' Revolutionary Party, no one in the Labour Party thought of militant as being a particular threat or being of particular importance, and so we're happy to leave them alone. And militant, after you know, two decades of work within the Labour Party, peaked in influence in the early to mid-1980s. They had two backbench MPs and control of the Liverpool City Council, but they didn't have anything to show for it aside from the Liverpool's powerful demonstration of the impossibility of municipal socialism. The attempted to uh, defy the then uh, conservative Thatcher government on their budget and ended up collapsing. Um, and so I think municipal socialism is just a few words on that as it's been revived by Jeremy Corbyn, by people like Chris Williamson. It has also entered back into political discourse on the left in the United States recently. And so most Marxists are critical of the whole concept of municipal socialism. Lenin thought it focused on minor questions of local self-government at the expense of the entire economic and state structure. And the contingent nature of local government makes municipal socialism incredibly precarious. For example, the Greater London Council in the 1980s was dissolved by Margaret Thatcher essentially because the Conservatives got sick of provocations by uh, Ken Livingston, who was the leader at the time, and the various projects that municipal socialist regimes have attempted to undertake, such as you know, welfare programs or various minor, minor forms of redistribution, are likewise very, very contingent given that municipal governments have very little power to uh, do really much of anything. Which brings us to the 21st century and to Jeremy Corbyn. So despite its somewhat ignoble origins as a anti-revolutionary, anti-Marxist, uh, and anti-proletariat social democratic socialist party, labor cannot be easily avoided by any other left-wing politics or the left in general, if for no other reason than its sheer size. The Labour Party has continued to position itself as the voice of the working class, much the British left has tended to believe, or accept, at least accept the inevitability of, of the Labour Party's position as the, the leaders of the working class. And so Jeremy Corbyn, when he was elected as Labour leader in September 2015... Sorry, sorry. Sorry. Um, so Jeremy Corbyn was elected in September 2015, and this prompted a quite rapid shift in the orientation of the rest of the British left towards labor. So existing groups dissolved themselves into labor. In some places, quite formally, the Alliance for Workers' Liberty deregistered itself as a political party with the Electoral Commission to make it easier for its activists and its members to join labor, because labor does not allow you to be a member of any other political party aside from the Cooperative Party and still be a member of labor. And so activists who spent the years labor was led by Tony Blair, by uh, Gordon Brown, and by Ed Miliband, trying to get projects like the Left Unity or the Trade Union Socialist Caucus off the ground, 
returned to the party, and they voted for Corbyn in both of his leadership elections, and they also participated, many of them, in momentum. And so there is something genuinely exciting about Jeremy Corbyn for much the left, namely the supposed rebirth of radical politics postulated by Richard Seymour in the book of the same name. And Corbyn certainly represents a clear break with New Labour, although it is less clear how much that may actually matter. If one takes claims made by columnists in places like the Daily Telegraph or the Spectator at face value, Jeremy Corbyn is a crypto-Bolshevik intent on an armed working-class insurrection to overthrow the British political establishment. If he was, that would at least be interesting, albeit somewhat politically outdated. It is understandable that the British right would mistake Labour's center-left redistributive program as radical Marxism. It's much more confusing why much of the British left seems to have made the same mistake. What is disappointing about Corbyn is how much the talk of radicalism has proved to be window dressing. Corbyn frequently spoke about socialism during his first leadership election campaign, albeit in very obscure ways or interpreting socialism as being something like the NHS. Um, but he's mostly abandoned that language since he was first elected. And what is disappointing about Corbynism is that its supporters think socialism is a 1970s style welfare state. And in practice, labor hasn't even bothered demanding or campaigning for the universalism of the post-war welfare state. Uh, it's simply, it's on a return to the 1970s. It's a return more to 2002. And so Labour's political aims are not even a minimum program on the basis that they don't exist in relationship to some greater demand. They don't exist in relationship to the end of capitalism, to the dictatorship of the proletariat, which could postulate something. They merely exist as their one demand is slightly higher unemployment benefits. Perhaps the specific problem with Labour is not its anti-Marxism, anti as anti-Marxism is pervasive throughout all forms of politics, but rather its reactivity and its insistence on anti-Toryism rather than any positive politics. And the left likes to dismiss Bernsteinian socialism with its insistence on gradualism, reform, and socialist institutions, but at least it represents a positive program aimed at transforming society. It has goals, it was oriented to the future, and it sought the emancipation of humanity. Its weakness was in its methods. Its methods were simply not up to the task it set itself. And its mistaking of the, the movement for socialism with socialism itself is part of that. Labor, on the other hand, isn't, hasn't even at that level. It has no positive program. It simply wants to remove the conservatives from power. One suspects many labor activists would be quite content if the conservatives were replaced with, say, the Liberal Democrats or the Greens. I don't want to give the impression that labor is purely awful, nor that being skeptical of anti-Toryism means we should support Toryism. The problem is unclear if there's anything in the Labour Party itself capable of affecting a deep transformation of society, of building socialism, of striving for the emancipation of all humanity. The discontents that Labour represents are real, and things like austerity and deflation of public services are, for many people, a genuine problem. But it's not something that the Labour Party, in its current form, is capable of solving in a lasting, meaningful way. Labour is offering better bonapartism than the current government, but surely we can demand something better than just slightly better bonapartism. And any movement or any party that is aiming for socialism has to point beyond status quo. And there's nothing that Labour is currently doing that seems interesting pointing beyond the present order of things in a transforming society. Thank you very much. Just questions, comments? You mentioned at the start that, um, or, and, and also with the reference to the AWL and Corbyn, that um, Marxist parties to the left are kind of uh, dissolving back into Labour. Some of them are. Some of them are. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering in terms of the, the history of the Labour Party, why is it that it's um, been the uh, pole of attraction for those who consider themselves to be on the Marxist left, whether that's um, from the founding moment in the 1890s to um, the Communist Party in the 20s and 30s, um, to you know, 
the small Trotskyist groups in the 50s and, and then as they grew a bit in the 60s. Um, why is it that it's been the Labour Party? Is it simply that trade unions, that it's had a trade union base, what does that mean? Um, what are the grounds on which they uh, self-rationalise that kind of um, orientation, however kind of positive or negative it is? The, uh, to quote a member of the AWL, I had a debate with about, with about a month ago. In his view, that's where the working class is. And so for some of these parties, they simply they look at labor, they say, well, this is, you know, this is the people who represent the working class, this is where the trade unions are, and we have to go to the working class. And they are less interested or much more skeptical of building something to attract the working class to them, uh, or building any kind of institution outside of the labor party. There's also this I think problem on a lot of these groups where their view of politics and political power is entirely down to the number of MPs a party has. And so the um, you know, Labour has been the largest or the second largest party in Parliament for I think a century now, and give or take a few years. And given that is how so many of these groups understand politics. They simply can't think of, you know, they, they recognize that given the British political system, they can't do what Delinka did in Germany and, you know, set up a, their own independent, you know, left-wing political party and get a bunch of seats. Because Del you know, Delinka in Germany doesn't represent any constituency, it simply wins off lists. Um, and so some of it's the, the British political system and their inability to overcome that. And I think some of it is that the Labour Party survives. The Labour Party has been around for a very long time, and most of the groups that enter it, they will pop up and collapse again. The, um, the I think the only political party that's older than on the left, certainly that's older than Labour, is the Socialist Party of Great Britain, which is very very small. So to answer your question, they have a variety of, of reasons for understanding it, but I think it does come down to this belief that that is where the working class is. The problem with that belief is that I'm not entirely sure it's true. So it's kind of hard to define, you know, there's various ways of finding who is the working class, but um, certainly if we look at the last general election, something like the British election studies, um, the, like a, a, a liberal sociology definition of the working class, Labour won more votes than anyone else did, but they won only by a couple points over the Conservative Party, and it's been that way for quite some time. They by no means represent, you know, the vast majority of the working class people or the vast majority of proletariat people. They don't have like a, a class constituency. And maybe they did 40 years ago. And so maybe that, you know, militant's argument for Labour's where the working class was in the 60s and 70s was correct, but it's certainly not correct now. Can I ask a follow-up then? Yeah. In that sense, there's obviously been a lot of um, commentary really since, um, I mean, since the Blair years, uh, but in particular since the financial crash of 2008, and then especially uh, Brexit, that, um, you know, the, the English working class is uh, no longer in the Labour Party, um, but it's been, you know, split by UKIP, and then the Tories, um, or the SNP in Scotland um, slightly earlier. Um, and maybe we can kind of come back to that question about the present and what that means, A, for um, you know, global politics in general, but, but particularly for Corbynism. But before, before we kind of get into that, I want to ask, um, OK, so the working class is in the Labour Party. What does that mean? Why, why would Marxists um, like care about that it, it raises all kinds of questions about what class is um, and what kind of uh, what Marxists would and wouldn't think about class because obviously um, the working class can be organised in all kinds of parties um, from you know, fascist to 
um, liberal. Um, so when the when the AWL say to you, well, you know, the Labour Party is where the working class is at, and that's what we've got to, that's why we've got to be there. What do they, what do they, mean, what do they mean by that? What's that kind of argument saying about the nature of class and and Marxist politics? It's a very tricky question. Um, I think on, on the one hand it represents a kind of a reflexivity on the part of some of these parties that um, you know, the, the working class is their constituency, whatever that means, and that's who they have to go to. Um, I think the, the, the question of like why the proletariat or why the working class is one that I often kind of struggled with in sort of coming in terms with Marxism or understanding Marxism. Um, I think in their conceptions, it is just that's who Marx talks about in books like Capital, is who Marx thinks is going to transform capitalism. And I think some of them are genuinely interested in things like the dictatorship of the proletariat. And to establish the dictatorship of the proletariat, you need the proletariat. And they go looking for them. I have a question about, um, uh, I have two questions. I'll go with the first one, it's better formulated. Um, you mentioned uh, the militant, yeah. and you outlined the development from the 60s in the New Left mm -hmm. up to the 80s, where you said that was the high point mm -hmm. of the group. Um, and then the period that I've been interested in with respect to the militant is actually the 90s, mm -hmm. because it split mm -hmm. uh, between uh, the SWP and the IMT. Um, mm -hmm. The Socialist Party. Yeah. IMT, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah SPEW, sorry. Yeah. The SPEW. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yes. Um, over the question of whether or not to join the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. So SPEW. Uh, wanted to establish an independent socialist party by organizing trade unions in Tusk, and the IMT wanted to continue supporting labor. Um, and so I was, I was wondering, because the 90s was like a period that, um, and you're, you didn't highlight in the talk. No, it's, it's, it's a place over the moon. But yeah, it's, it's also, because it's also the period of new labor. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm wondering, like, to what extent, uh, like, what do you make of that split that happened in the 90s with, within the militant? And also, like, to relate it to the other question I had, with, I think you were implying at certain points that um, having an independent socialist party from the Labour Party mm -hmm. would be uh, at least interesting, uh, <laughs> uh, if not um, preferable. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering, how come that hasn't worked out for SPEW? Mm -hmm. But also, how come that hasn't worked out for neo social democratic parties um, on the, in the style of Dilenka and Syriza? Mm -hmm. um, like recently there was, I keep mentioning this, uh, this, this week segment where Zizek had this like bizarre conversation, um, but he was, you know, basically unanimously everyone on that segment was saying that, uh, neo-social democracy is dead, like neo Marxism is dead. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm wondering like, um, I think also that people who join momentum, either on the hard left or like the soft left, they have this idea that they're gonna transform labor into that kind of party. And so like, what are the prospects for that? So, so this has been like a meandering. Yeah, it's like three questions. Three questions, but. Um, I guess 
Oh, so I'm like four questions. So I guess there's the first is like split the militant, 1990s, um, an independent socialist party that's not labor, mm -hmm. and then the global momentum. All right. So split the militant, I think that came about because, I mean, for a few reasons. For some of it, just is that, you know, after the high point in the mid 1980s, it became impossible for militant to organize within the Labour Party in the way that it was doing. Like it was effectively the fifth or sixth largest party in the country, but entirely excluded the Labour. And so they were just mostly kicked out. Um, and I mean, I'm not sure about all the exact personal reasons behind these splits. I know that they expelled their leader, Ted Grant, at that time, um, which would definitely result in a sort of orientation. I believe that he was kicked out by Alan Woods, who was the person who made the decision. He was the leader of Socialist Appeal, which is the name the IMT operates under in the UK. Um, but I think that the the some of it just became, came out because of the difficulties of operating the Labour Party. And secondly, the left likes to go into the Labour Party when the, labor, when the left of Labour is in power. So militant have been d engaged in this process of entry since, since the 1960s, but their high point is associated with the leadership of Michael Foote, who was, prior to Jeremy Corbyn, probably the most left-wing person, if we're gonna use this, this kind of language, to be the leader of the Labour Party. So he ran an election manifest in 1983 that included things like unilateral nuclear disarmament um, and was considered to be very you know, soft on groups like militant. Um, and so in the 1990s, with a more like to the right group in power in the form of, and power within the Labour Party in the form of New Labour, really sort of discouraged a lot of the left. And I think that there is sort of this, this, I did kind of mention this briefly, the, that Jeremy Corbyn is a split, is a break from New Labour, but it's not that necessarily big of a break. His um, recent general election slogan, for the many, not the few, is from Shelley, but it's also in the new clause for the Tony Blair authored. So it's not a particularly different idea from what currently exists in the party. Um, what would a neo-Marxist party look like and why have they failed? I mean, by, by some standards, but certainly by the standards of the British left, I think a lot of them think Syriza has succeeded in as much as it is in government in Greece. Now, the Greek government might collapse at any moment now, apparently, and they might not be, but given that it's sort of the metric where a lot of the left thinks of a success as being, um, Syriza has achieved something. It hasn't done anything with that achievement. It's failed to build on that achievement. It's failed to do anything despite being the Greek government. Um, and I think within the UK there's challenges because of this like complete orientation to the um, uh, you know, to, to electoral results in general elections that make it difficult for smaller independent parties to get off the ground and build kind of themselves into mass parties. And they're also just let down I think fundamentally by their politics, which is very um, workerist, it's very, very vulgar. It is seems very much out of place. And then in Momentum, I, I actually don't think that a lot of people in Momentum want to transform the Labour Party. Mm. I think that, I mean, there's definitely some that do. I mean, the AWL does genuinely want to transform the Labour Party, and all of them who have not been kicked out are in Momentum in some capacity. And But I think most people who have joined Momentum are just sort of longing for this idealized proper labor government, whatever that actually looks like, and are just interested in getting labor elected and are you know, rather ambivalent about what kind of labor party that actually is, so long as it is a labor party, or more importantly, is not the conservative party. Um, again, one of the founders of Momentum was a former liberal democrat activist, and before that was a candidate for the Greens in the local council election. So they, you know, they, they from across the political spectrum, so long as it's an anti-Tory political position. I have like a, yeah, yeah. a follow-up point, which is I think, um, well, it seems to like to me that one a common view among the movement people, like regard, like yes, I think there is like a centrist that in in the organization, but I also think like on the on the left of that organization, there's this, there's like the split at the grassroots momentum. 
And I think of the people who are in that, involved in that, like including the rad radical liberal kind of student types who mm -hmm. join just to flyer for labor. But there seems to be a shared vision that once Corbyn's elected, uh, like there'll be some kind of military coup. <laughs> And that's like a potential for them to like uh, step in or something. Um, so yeah, I wonder. I wonder if you want to comment on that. But also, I also think there is a shared point of interest in uh, democratizing the Labour Party in the way that they put it. And so, like, what would that like? What I don't know. Maybe this is too many questions. Yeah. I, and the democratizing. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I was going to say this, which is also the. Um, the Tony Benn campaign mm -hmm. in the 80s, first for vice leader mm -hmm. um, and then for leadership of the Labour Party, when she ch challenged um, Kinnock, um, was all about this um, democratising the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. I think that is that has been a, a big thing for a lot of the left for quite some time, certainly things like one of the, the hallmarks of the, in the 80s Labour Party was the idea of mandatory reselection, which has been brought back by Jeremy Corbyn, which is the ability for his interests of Labour Parties to deselect their a sitting MP and have them run for, for the party nomination again for the an upcoming election, um, effectively challenging the ability of MPs to you know, hold safe constituencies as long as they want them. I think the, the idea of there being a coup if there's a Jeremy Corbyn leadership election is this sort of... I, I have two things. First, I think it's a very bizarre delusion. I don't think... You know, the British establishment is well aware that Jeremy Corbyn is not a threat to the British establishment, um, despite some kind of weird frothing from a few newspaper columnists. He is perfectly harmless, and the state is well aware of this fact. Um, I mean, some of them might be more worried about the fact that he is a Republican, which he doesn't talk about very much because he evidently is electorally savvy enough to know that it's not going to win many votes. But I don't think that particularly worries the state either. And then even if there was a coup, I'm not entirely sure what momentum would do about it. Um, you know, momentum is not. You know, they could they could organize protests and imagine if there was a coup, you would see quite big protests. But if this is, you know, they if. The, the fantasy they have of like a serious proper military coup actually comes to fruition. Street protests aren't going to do anything. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what it is that they're thinking. There's a certain kind of like, you know, they're having fun. They're enjoying themselves. They're getting laid. That's really I think what some of them are doing in the moment. Are they? Well, I mean, they're, they're hoping. They're hoping. They're hoping. To. They're hoping. To. You know, it's it's. Uh, and momentum is emulating sort of like the conservative student movement in the United States. So it's like it's, it's making politics fun. Mm. Like I certainly think it is quite. It would be quite fun. You'd have you'd enjoy yourself in momentum, particularly if you enjoy knocking on doors. Um, well, I think the, the the point is that it has a. Um, psychological function mm -hmm. that um, one needs to make the world a nicer place mm -hmm. right and obviously the world is a fucked up place so yeah, they're not wrong about the idea to make the world a nicer place it's just but there there is a kind of um, uh, no, the the reason the reasons for getting involved that we like we joke about the um, the social function of um, of participating in a grassroots politics movement, but um, there is a real I think I can't think of a better term but palliative psychological function that actually expresses something real about a, a crisis in politics more generally. Um, the world is changing. And uh, people's kind of uh, certainties are being um, shaken, um, so that so it does serve a, a kind of a real a real function in that sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, it definitely there there is a sense of, of um, 
discontent. Um, I mean, there's the, the fascinating relationship between um, housing tendency and political support, which is um, if you rent, either privately or from a social uh, a council or from a housing association, you are overwhelmingly likely to support the Labour Party or other left wing parties. If you own your own home, you overwhelmingly support the Conservatives. Uh, so that's why, for example, in the 1980s, the Margaret Thatcher's signature right to buy program was a political masterstroke because she transformed millions of people from devoted labor voters to devoted conservative voters basically overnight. And so some of the discontents in momentum are um, to do things like housing. Like it's, it's, I think there's a certain degree of, or a significant number of middle class people in their 20s are joining momentum because they're realizing the only way they're ever going to be able to afford a house is if their parents die in a car crash and they get a life insurance payout. And I think that that is, it's these kinds of crises. So there is this sense of discontent. Um, and I think it's one where to solve that, like solve the immediate problem, there's, there's no reason why labor would be able to do that. All right, anyone else, please? You said that um, Michael Foot um, is to the most left of the Labour Party and then like historically leader Bar, Jeremy Corbyn. And um, what is it about them or their policies that puts them to the left, uh, Bar, like over other Labour leaders? And what does it mean to be on the left? So some of it is the question of democratizing the Labour Party that has been brought up, or the issue of democratizing the Labour Party. So Michael Foote, I believe, was um, brought in the idea of mandatory three selections for MPs um, and attempted to make it easier for you know, grassroots members of the party, of the trade unions, to get involved in policy making. And it is sort of the same thing under Jeremy Corbyn. Corbyn's talked a lot about you know, the importance of the members. He keeps on citing um, support amongst the membership in um, internal party conflicts. And so I think it's, it's that, I think some of it is as well this, um, I guess like commitment to, or like a stronger commitment to you know, trade unionism um, or trade union values. In that way, um, you know, Corbyn is not that much of a split from say Ed Miliband who also democratized the Labour Party, switching the leadership election from um, a caucus-based system of MPs, had a third of the votes, trade unions a third of the votes, members a third of the votes, to one member, one vote, uh, and let anyone join for three pounds and vote. Um, and so in that way, so I think Ed Miliband might also be able to be, be grouped in there, though his policies on, um, say, like, austerity are slightly different. And there's certain- Although paradoxically, that was, in a way to, the one member, one vote and the leadership election was a, a way of um, a mitigating against the power of the trade unions. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's, that's, that so was... There's a tension there in the, the kind of democracy, mm -hmm. right? And it's also quite amusing that if that system had been in place um, when Ed Miliband was elected, he would have lost to his brother, um, David Miliband, and Ed Miliband only won because of the trade unions still weaken their power. Um, so I think it is, it is things like that. I think it is also like a, a in some ways it's a sense of anti-Americanism. Um, so Jeremy Corbyn is, you know, quite well known for his anti-American views. It's, it's the whole, um, I don't think Jeremy Corbyn's a Putin supporter, but he seems very like soft on Russia, um, as we've seen with things like the attempted poisoning, or the poisoning and attempted murder of the former Russian spy in Salisbury, and Corbyn being very much hesitant to you know, condemn Russia for it, and was um, it, it, it was not a kind of like prudent waiting for information to come out. It was very clearly like a, hoping that it wasn't Russia. I think long past that was a reason we to hope um, because Russia is not America. Um, so I think, and Michael Foote's very much the same way. Michael Foote, um, I get, yeah, I'm not sure if he wanted to get the UK or NATO or not. But he certainly was, you know, he was pro-nuclear disarmament, he wanted a reduction in the American military in the UK, um, and um, a general kind of like reorientation of British foreign policy. I think that is what makes them to the left, but I think within the confines of the Labour Party, the differences between, um, you know, the left and the right, you know, 
leadership is often the goal of an academic. There is a fantastic uh, article from BuzzFeed, which justifies its entire existence with this one post. It's something like 17 reasons, or 17 ways Tony Blair was to the left of Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and I think that in some ways, it's a, it's a helpful way to think about some of these people, but it, there are limitations to it. What, what are, I mean, um, the second part of, of Sophia's question, mm -hmm. um, which is the kind of more broad historic what is the left mm -hmm. question. Um, I think you've touched on a number of ways in which the um, a kind of spectrum of politics within the Labour Party has been um, hashed out really since the 1950s, um, or really since the 60s, um, and I, I want to emphasise the, the, the issue of nuclear disarmament, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of the question around which New Left Review forms in 1960, um, after Labour loses three elections on the trot. Um, and there's this kind of crisis in the Labour Party and Hugh Gates Gill's leadership is really in question and he's seen as being a, a right wing, you know, a, a former lefty who's, who's kind of gone right wing. Um, and at the Labour Party conference in 1960 in Scarborough, there's a vote in the membership on nuclear disarmament and um, they win the vote basically. And it seems like Labour is transforming into this left-wing party because they want to vote about nuclear disarmament. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really where the kind of, um, obviously there's the, the campaign for nuclear disarmament, the CND, which is a very big role in left politics in the UK from the, from the late 50s onwards. Um, but that really is a kind of um, central issue that reorients the new left around the Labour Party. And so it's, it is bizarre, like having that come back with Corbyn. You know, we talk about Trident. Would he pr press the red button? Wouldn't he? Mm -hmm. um, that that's kind of this this faint memory of, of what that um, argument was about within the Labour Party in, um, in the sixties. So I, so there's so there's that stuff, but so there's that kind of internal sense of what the left is in Labour. But how does that relate to you know, the question we might ask in Platypus um, more generally, what is the left? Mm -hmm. You know, to what extent can we, to what extent is that Labour Party barometer a kind of um, a symptom of regression, a, a degraded form of thinking about um, what the left is? I mean, it's a regression. I think it's also a, um, a kind of like a limited it's like the left as like a contextual, like I guess like small L left as like a contextual way of orienting people. There's the, the great bit in the Kolakowski essay, that's a Kolakowski and the concept of the left where he talks about there's a left in the Nazi party, there's a left in the fascist parties. And so that's sort of what I mean when I'm talking about the left and the Labour party. The left more generally is, uh, do you mean like what, how the Labour party relates to the left more generally? Or like how we would think about the Labour Party as part of the left. Can I add like a, another historical moment? Because you mentioned like the 60s and you're saying like that the political imagination today is largely based on that moment. But I guess I want to add in like another moment on this like timeline uh, of like uh, ni like 1920 and Lenin's left-wing communism where he's talking about joining the Labour Party in a really different way uh, with respect to uh, there's mass uprisings of workers going on uh, anyways and the idea was to support the labor party like a new supports a hangman that's the quote so the, it was to show that the party was not in the interest of the working class that they would form a, an independent socialist party uh, or a communist party at that point um, but it goes back to a point that Lenin was making earlier which is that the Labour Party shouldn't have been introduced to the Secondary National Labour Party, but as a trade union, because it wasn't organized as a socialist party. 
Um, so I guess like the the horizon I'm introducing into the question is not really 1820, but is really the 19th century, uh, in the sense that like um, Marx's like unique contribution wasn't like that. Uh, the new problem of the 19th century was the was proletarianization. Uh, others have thought that as well, um, but rather was that proletarianization pointed beyond itself um, and pointed to the task of a, a party for socialism to work through its self-contradiction. Um, so, I, so I, like, that, I mean, and that still doesn't, like, the, you could still ask the question of what is the left. Um, but yeah, I guess to, to throw relief onto the 60s moment, I guess. I mean, in some ways, the, the Labour Party is set up against the left. Like the the, um, um, the trade union congress was designed to try to extract concessions out of the workers or out of out of liberal governments. The Fabian Society was a pro-imperialist, um, kind of I guess, liberal group that called itself socialists. Um, and so I guess like the left, if we're thinking of the left as like a movement for overcoming capitalism and something like a dictatorship of the proletariat, that's definitely not what labor is. What about freedom? I mean, for a lot of the labor party, freedom is a terrifying concept they'd rather avoid or oppose. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, people we think of like, this is, I guess, a somewhat Hayekian concept of giving the, the institution we're in at the moment that makes sense, is if you think of like freedom as choice, like the ability to choose what you want to do, um, which one you have, et cetera, et cetera. Labor is often very much opposed to choice. Um, even within the realm of like something that is very paternalistic, like the welfare state, or like the NHS, the you know, much of the Labor Party has long opposed um, certainly the grassroots of the Labour Party want to post them and they want to choose the doctor you go to. Um, which is not even, that's not even approaching freedom in the way that we're thinking of like um, bourgeois freedom in being able to transform your life, which I think is what the left is trying to achieve, is giving you the freedom to um, you know, live however they want to. Um, I don't think that's, that's something the Labour Party is particularly interested in. I think that freedom for the left generally is the point. Um, and for the Labour Party, it is only not the point. It's not, it's not just not the point of the Labour Party. It, is, it exists in contrast or in opposition to many of the stated aims of the Labour Party. Yeah, I think, because whereas historically the left has been uh, engaged in the struggle for freedom, um, at a historic level as a task inherited from the bourgeois revolutions. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that's kind of very prominent in the Labour Party that really does come out of the whole kind of liquidation of Marxism in, in Stalinism is the uh, prioritisation of a concept called social justice mm -hmm. um, over things like freedom. Um, and in, interestingly, it's one of the continuities between Blair and Corbyn, right? Social justice, community justice, um, this kind of thing. And um, that's the kind of vein in which they interpret Shelley, right? For the many, not the few. Um, it's taken to be uh, social justice, right? Um, and I think um, it's obviously a, not what Shelley had in mind. Um, it was um, for the many, not the few, i.e. like, how can we keep pursuing freedom? Um, Julian Harney's 
Democratic Association in, in London in the, 18, in the late 1830s, um, or in the mid-1830s rather, which um, separated itself from uh, radical and liberal elements in, in the Chartist movement by saying um, that universal suffrage wasn't the end in itself but a means, right, that um, uh, I think it's um, political, the, the slogan was uh, political power our means social happiness our ends. Um, but this idea that, anyway, so that for the many would be like a means to pursue the freedom. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you think, what is this concept of social justice? Um, people on the left talk about it a lot. What, it, what do they mean by it and why is it such an important aspect of, of um, Labour Party politics? I think social justice in the context of the Labour Party is often, so some of it is about like redressing, um, I guess not contemporary wrongs because that's a different form of justice, but redressing past wrongs. Um, and so I'm picking the base of communities. So again, like the, the Blair I caused for has this, um, yeah, all of us as a community in which power, wealth, and opportunity are in the hands of the many. So I think social justice is this like sense of there being a collective and that the needs of the collective are what are important. Um, so it is justice for sort of not like the society as a whole, but for groups of people within the society. It's almost this like kind of contextualization of justice. Um, I think that it's become important to them for a few reasons. Some of it is, yeah, it is a kind of Stalinist abandonment of the pursuit of freedom itself. It is a move towards sort of communitarianism and a rejection of any kind of like universal values into a much more kind of contextual basis. Um, and is I think it is important for the left, or not rather not important for the left, but is important for a lot of people within labor, um, for the, just because of, it's, it is something that they feel con is concrete, is like realizable, that you can somehow like achieve social justice in the here and now, um, but what social justice is, is, is something that's not very clear, and as what is unfortunate one of the important things about, Lee, uh, about Jeremy Corbyn and his turn to, uh, you know, towards any more communities and protecting communities, is it has forestalled this recognition that was beginning to happen under NL Ban and the Labour Party that communities are, you know, places that people feel comfortable in, they're their homes, they're their families. They're also incredibly oppressive in some cases, and it is this. Um, kind of contradictory thing where trying to use communities as a means for social justice ends up impeding um, what you might call social justice or just justice generally. Is, um, is social justice the same as equality in the sense that, um, like, in the parliamentary sense of left and right, the left would typically be aligned towards equality and the right would be freedom as a dichotomy? Um, are they like me? For Labour, for instance, is freedom an obstacle to equality? And what do you think that means? I don't think freedom is an obstacle to equality. I think that you know they're, they. I mean, firstly, equality is one of these terms. So, what exactly do you mean by equality? Because there's um, people tossed around a lot. I don't always think a great understanding of what they mean by it. So, do you mean equality by like? I mean, what does labor mean by equality? Well, labor, labor means, when labor talks about equality, labor talks about things like Gini coefficients, distribution of income, distribution of wealth. It's very, like, Basalian in that regard. It's, they want a more equal society in the way that Germany is a very equal society. So Germany is, in many ways, a model for a lot of labor party. And if, you know, the, the Gini coefficient, the measure of income inequality in a society, um, the higher the Gini coefficient, the more unequal. Mm -hmm. Prior to taxes and transfers, Germany is more unequal than the United States. It's just they have a massive system of redistributing 
money through taxes. Uh, and that is, I think, how the Labour Party views equality. They are not interested in any kind of like genuine transformation of society into something that is meritocratic or that is um, egalitarian, to use a silly different term, but merely in redistribution to give the semblance of some notion of equality. Right, because uh, like, I get the sense when like, um, you know, like the banner in like, France, freedom, equality, fraternity, they're not, you know, they're not in contradiction with each other, equality and freedom. Mm -hmm. But in the sense, as we might talk about equality and freedom today, they are in contradiction with each other. You know, you can't, you've got to trade off some freedom for some equality and so forth. I would, well, I mean, I would, I would actually bounce back to a point that I find more slightly earlier, which is that, like, um, so, like, in the, the example that Efron gave, uh, you know, the, like the, the Labour Party was pushing for one vote, one, mem one member, one vote, but that actually undermined the power of the, lab the, the labor unions. And so that's, um, there, there's an instance of equality that's actually self-contradictory. Um, and so I would say, like, it's not that necessarily freedom and equality are at the expense of one another, but rather that they're both self contradictory. Um, like you just you just mentioned LaSalle. Mm -hmm. um, but like uh, um, you know equally like the attempt to try and resolve the problem at the level of society alone would also be equally self contradictory. Um, like so if I'm and I were just talking before this actually about like about chartism. But um, you know the first kind of unions were uh, actually took the form of gangs, <laughs> actually, like, you know, people, like, murdering uh, strike breakers because they would cost, you know, the, the union members their jobs and their livelihood. Um, and so, in a way, like, that's a, that's a self-contradictory pursuit of freedom, where one is defending their livelihood on the basis of bourgeois freedom, but in order to do so, there's, like, this, uh, necessary regression. Um, and so, like, when I said earlier, like, there's a self-contradiction in the proletariat's pursuit of freedom, um, that's, like, that's what I'm, like, it's not, like, a logical, it's, like, a real problem. It's also, they're self-contradictory in that, you know, in, in the domination of capital in capitalism means that, um, you know, fulfillment of either freedom or equality is effectively impossible under capitalism. So, and also because of how, you know, how much it influences how we think, I think we sort of do posit that they, they are in opposition to each other, even though, you know, freedom under capitalism is not actually freedom, and equality under capitalism is not actually equality. I have um, one more question yeah, about clause four. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you said clause four is um, not sufficiently socialist, of course, it's about nationalization, that's state capitalism, I think you said. Um, mm -hmm. Just nationalization of industry. I was wondering what you thought about, I'm not sure if you've heard about, um, Labour commissioned a report into different forms of ownership where they discussed, um, yeah, nationalization, but also um, municipal control of industry and cooperative control of industry, which of course, you know, they're more autonomous, they're not quite nationalization. Is this sufficiently radical? What, what would it mean for Labour to incorporate this into policy? I mean, then it goes worse than nationalization. So, the whole like municipalization of things is just, you know, municipal socialism and municipalitism and like community organizing, all of this stuff is, it's just like nationalism on a smaller scale. Like the, the, the people who are, you know, organizing in Manchester to keep Manchester, whatever the hell Manchester is, aren't really that different from like the weird Minutemen guys you get patrolling the US-Mexican border going after legal immigrants. Like their attitude towards like this is our patch, no one else can touch it is kind of the same. On the so I'm gonna get carried away there. On the question of like cooperative ownership and municipal ownership, again I think it's just you, it's taking all of the problems of nationalization and just shrinking them down to a smaller scale. So that I mean, the theory behind nationalization is that if the if the state is democratic, if the government is democratic, and it controls industry, mm. there therefore the people control mm. the industry. It is you know quite flawed in both theory and practice, but at least there's an idea there. Um, something like in the case of in the case of a local council, what does it mean to um, you know 
how things are going to be able to control. Well, councils do basically two things. They pick up your bins and they do social care. And you know, nationalizing bin collection or municipalizing bin collection is, I don't think, has anything to do with socialism. It's purely a question of like efficiency or inefficiency. So if it saves the local council money to bring its bin collection in house, that's great. They should do that. But that's not socialism. The, the danger here is that we um, think that it's an issue of policy. No, yeah, it's absolutely um, not. These are these are technical problems. They're not political problems. Right, and there's no reason. I mean. It, it might seem actually that there's no reason why um, in building a mass workers party for socialism, um, having something, some kind of, you know, electing people to municipal councils, um, building up local parties, campaigning on local issues, um, uh, wouldn't be, you know, a valid um, part of that. I'm thinking, um, of the kinds of electoral victories that the Socialist Party of America had in <coughs> the early part of the uh, first decade, the first decade of the 20th century, say, uh, where you have like socialist mayors um, in in various places in the states, and and um, of course they're not um, instigating socialism, and of course the uh, redistributive um, and kind of uh, social um, uh, products that they produce, for want of a better word, um, fall well below the way in which American capitalism and world capitalism was organised at the time, which was at an you know at international um, level. But they were a, a productive part in the. Uh, building of that party and in the development of um, a you know mass working class party for socialism. Um, so I guess what is it that kind of um, and a lot of people in the Labour Party will make that kind of argument. They'll be like, well, look, we know we're not really claiming that um, you know these municipal changes are. Um, you know that doing the bins better or having, you know, more social care is uh, socialism. But we're like slowly developing people's consciousness. We're bringing more people into the party. We're building mm -hmm. local power bases. Mm -hmm. These are all actually like, you know, these are all things that a socialist party would want to um, would want to do. Um, and that's, that's, that's distinctive, as you pointed out, between doing that. And what I think this Labour Party report you're referring to is, and I haven't read it unfortunately, so I'm not entirely sure, but I'm just giving councils ownership over these things. I'm, I'm advocating cooperative ownership. I'm yeah, advocating cooperative really ownership. I don't know what it would be. Um, isn't, this, isn't this like a new way for people to relate to one another? That could be a genuinely socialist policy in that sense? Like, it could form a basis or something? I remember of a bunch of cooperatives. I don't feel I have any relationship to anyone else in the cooperative. Well, I was, yes, I, I, I just wanted to, there's two things, like, I guess, I'll come back to the municipal thing in a minute, but with the cooperatives, I mean, I guess we have to look back at, like, Marx's response to, kind of, Robert Owen and, and people like that, which is to, kind of, recognise that, that certainly this, this new, 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 form, new ways of um, organising and workers, workers' ownership or um, self-control um, might have expressed something of like the possibility of a, a like a changed, changed social relations, but but as a kind of tactic for overcoming capitalism or at the level of society, it was that, that um, it doesn't address the, the political in a sense. Um, I guess they, they'll become like the new form of factory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, Rosa Luxemburg also touched on this. She's she's like favourable of like. She says that, like you know, the like the co you know she's referring to Bernstein, who's also very like the cooperatives are bringing about socialism within capitalism. That's mm -hmm. that's, that's happening. It's just we just need to keep like spreading it. Um, uh, but but uh, Luxembourg is 
say, well, actually, no, because um, uh, in, in whenever um, the, the workers themselves become like become their own boss, but within a capitalist system, they end up enforcing the kind of law of um, value on themselves, and and at the same time, they're like a boss, like a small business. So um, there's a kind of a small business character, to the, sort of petty bourgeois character, to the cooperative, and that they they become more subject to. They didn't point beyond themselves to like possibilities for a changed political sphere, but um, in and of themselves were not sufficient to bring about socialism. Mm -hmm. On the municipal thing, um, I work in Battersea, which was like one of these like radical trade union boroughs, with a mayor, uh, John Burns, who later. I mean, and it's what's interesting about it is it actually expresses a lot, um, just the kind of political move, like shifts and changes. That in the time, but John Burns was this character that ended up in the Liberal Party, but was also in the Social Democratic Federation in the late 19th century, radical trade unionists fighting, fighting for the um, eight hour day, all this kind of thing. Um, but there was this kind of, and it, it actually t touches back on Chris's article on the Gilded Age, um, in that although he, you know, in some ways he was sort of, you know, a very important leader within the, within the trade union movement, also, like very influenced by the Dis municipality um, and, and the kind of progressive progressivism, um, and, and um, I think, yeah, it's kind of it, um, it, it, there is a sense in which it's like a kind of um, um, yeah, this kind of local local organising can have very different. party is also important in terms of being able to, I guess, like, direct with political tactics. Because you mentioned the Socialist Party in the United States, and I think, if I remember correctly, they also had a, a tactic of running for sheriff a lot and trying to get socialist sheriffs because they like so sheriffs in the United States, and if the socialists control the law enforcement locally, they can decide how law enforcement responds to strikes, mm -hmm. which is a quite important lever to have. And is you know it's, it's a political tactic that makes sense, but in the absence of you know if, if you do that in one place it doesn't really mean anything. You need to have a mass party that is doing that in a load of places for it to actually you know become anything meaningful. Like these sorts of individual things don't matter much. Also, the point of cooperatives like Spain has embraced cooperatives. They're a massive part of the economy. It's a company called Mondragon, which is a cooperative, which is one of the biggest companies in the world. Spain's a capitalist country. It's not really any different than any other country in Europe, mm -hmm. despite a lot of cooperatives. So, um, yeah, and it was his summary was really good that they're useful, but they, you know, the, the political landscape, if there's not the politics to accompany them, if 
there's not a transformation of society around the mountain. Just a slightly different way of organizing mm -hmm. business. Okay, so um, maybe we can, um, for a moment, turn discussion a bit to the future. Mm -hmm. um, we are sort of over halfway with the Brexit process. Um, the Labour Party is ambivalent and or split on the question of Brexit, um, but in, the, in a sense has really come down on this customs partnership um, thing. But obviously the way in which Brexit has shaken up the electoral alignments of the United Kingdom has kind of caused new problems and possibilities for the Labour Party. Um, and we've got this kind of left-wing turn with Jeremy Corbyn, with the mass influx of membership, uh, right up to half a million. Uh, many of the new members on the so-called momentum left are anti-Brexit. Um, at the same time, the Tories are, however, kind of confusedly um, staggering towards um, uh, repealing austerity, right? They have no longer talk about these targets of getting rid of the debt. Um, there's all kinds of new spending plans. Um, there's all kinds of um, both rhetoric and policy around um, uh, social justice and uh, state spending. Um, the next big deadline for Brexit is um, March 2019, right, which is the kind of um, the end of the negotiations, ostensibly. Um, there is a real sense of instability around the Theresa May government, lots of kind of problems and weaknesses um, as it's propped up by the DUP. Um, what do you see kind of, um, where is this going uh, in the immediate future? What, what, the, what is the left trying to achieve? You know, the left, you've talked about the left's stated aim of transforming the Labour Party democratising the Labour Party, deselection, uh, getting people elected and, and really getting a, getting a Corbyn government. Um, in light of all the kind of things I've mentioned, um, where do you see the, the left taking those aims or, or, um, or going in, in the immediate future? I can see the left accidentally breaking the Labour Party without meaning to um, over Brexit. Because you're sort of saying that Labour um, has become the party of like the, the customs partnership and the labor leadership are the customs partnership. Labor members are the party of Remain, effectively. The best data I've seen is about 80% of labor members, and they not only voted Remain in 2016 for the normal, or referendum, it's that they oppose Brexit and want a second referendum. That's four fifths. That is, and it's more than the Liberal Democrats who have, who we typically think of being like the most pro-European party. The Liberal Democratic membership is less interested in the second referendum than the Labour membership is. Um, and so the left would end up, um, again, the, the, the British left has sort of mixed feelings towards things like the EU. Um, so they could end up splitting themselves within Labour. Um, Labour can end up in a fair amount of trouble because I think a vote on Brexit is going to be on the party conference in September this year. They avoided it last year, but I think there's going to be a bit of one. Um, and so I think the future of Labour over Brexit is the party is potentially quite unstable and could become quite unstable very, very quickly as they, the difference of opinion, because Jeremy Corbyn is, I think, a long-standing you're a skeptic, or is very skeptical about Europe, about the EU, um, like a lot of the Labour left. Uh, he's sort of taking up to Tony Benn, viewing it as being, uh, and Benn was incorrectly, but very anti-democratic, or non-democratic, and um, unaccountable, and 
that is, I mean, I think a lot of his supporters probably share that view. However, they disagree that Britain leaving the EU is going to do anything about that, and that a Britain outside the EU is going to itself be ruled by people who are any more accountable or democratic, and maybe even less accountable or democratic. Um, and so I think that this may, there may suddenly be this quite substantial split within Labour between, on a very big issue between Corbyn and the vast majority of his supporters. Um, so I think that is a potential future. I think that um, it's always difficult to guess with these things because uh, I think anything I put, I say now, I'm going to get entirely wrong. Um, but let's roll with it. I think that the you know we might have an election and we might end up with a Corbyn government and then they end up having to deliver Brexit. Um, either and so then then they end up in a position where either they deliver Brexit and whatever the fallout of that is that they own it, or they somehow try to stop or delay Brexit, which raises up a load of other issues around, um, I guess, just, just having done that. Um, you know, the, the problem is, is that it's not entirely clear where, I guess, I mean, we, we have the, ref, the general, oh, we have the referendum, the problem is within British politics, is we don't really know what to make of, of referendums like that. We don't really know what to make of um, those kinds of constitutional questions. So I think that we could have an election in October. That's a, the rumor that's going around. I don't think that's very likely. I think that in the meantime, the left is going to try to sort of push this democratizing labor with varying degrees of success. Um, I think largely failing to do anything in terms of democratizing labor. Um, and certainly if they had democratized labor as brought up nuclear disarmament, I think a democratic, you know, if you had a one member, one vote election within the Labour Party on nuclear disarmament, they'd oppose it. Um, or they would support nuclear disarmament, rather, they'd oppose nuclear weapons. Um, so I think we may see some splits within the Labour Party and we may see some of these left groups that have been attempting entryism to slowly and quietly abandon it um, as they sort of recognize that things like Brexit and the other impossibility of democratizing the Labour Party, and as well, even though they do succeed in democratizing the Labour Party, I think some of these left groups may realize their constituencies are very, very small, and you know, they sort of have believed themselves for 40 years if they were participating within a democratic labor party, they would win. And then when they don't win, I'm not entirely sure how well they'll take that. So. Do you, I mean, we talked earlier about other examples where the left has kind of gone into labor and then come out again. Mm -hmm. um, is that a kind of, is that circus potentially endless? Meaning, what are the resources left to these left-wing groups once they retreat from Labour again? Are they going to be able to reproduce themselves as um, whatever kind of sect or pressure group outside of the Labour Party? Um, or is this kind, you know, as they have done in the past, um, or will this be something, uh, you know, the, will the further terminal. disintegrate, right, is this terminal? <laughs> like, is there going to, you know, that you talk about the AWL, um, and they're basically able to um, maybe gather a bit of strength in reproducing themselves through this kind of, uh, turn into momentum. Um, they've got their newspaper inside the Labour Party and all this stuff. But when um, you know politics moves on and history moves on, and uh, whatever whatever that's going to look like, if they decide to, or some of them decide to, then leave the Labour Party, 
um, are they going to be able to, you know, are they going to have the ideological as well as much as the physical resources to um, to be the AWL outside of that again? I mean, I think their their reg their regression ideologically is going to continue whether or not they are in or out of the labor market. Um, I think that in some ways it is perhaps more obvious when they are outside of the Labour Party. Um, the Labour Party kind of gives them a bit of cover, and when they're within the Labour Party, they can kind of avoid questions of ideology and just focus on getting the Tories out. When they're outside of the Labour Party, it becomes a little bit more difficult to do that, and I think that is still their orientation all of the time. I mean, even you know, the SWP is not participating in Labour, but you know, they talk about getting rid of the Tory government. Um, and I think that either way the decline is relatively terminal. I think that the decline of certainly of ideology and ideological thinking is I don't think it has, I don't think it has nothing to do with the Labour Party, but the Labour Party is just a symptom of that. Um, and you know, the, the decline is take takes place in countries that don't have an equivalent to the Labour Party in this exact way, or certainly don't have an equivalent to the Labour Party in terms of like a, a central social democratic center left in like a political science thing on a Marxist term. Um, but you know, a social democratic party that the left uh, goes into, twirls around for a few years and then leaves again. Um, you know, there's still the ideological regression of the left. You know, no one no one does no no one engages in like an entryism to the SPD in Germany anymore. We did we have Delinka. But there's still the ideological regression of both Delinka and the SPD. I don't know, I, I think it's probably... I think the, you, the idea of, um, okay, we could have a Labour government and they might have to move to Brexit, that's good to just reckon with for a minute and, and okay, so, and what that will mean. Because in a way, although it could mean that they stave it off, the other thing might be that, that the middle class movies have to just shut up about it as well, about their concern about Remain. Uh, and might be pacified into, you know, just accepting Brexit. Yeah. Um, but I don't know whether that whether that will actually help win them support more broadly in society. I don't know. I mean, pacifying eighty percent of your membership is going to be a pretty hard ask for any party. Well, it's not just a case of pacifying, but it's it, it's both. Um, more or less spontaneously people um, creating ideological justifications for what's happening anyways. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that um, the left will come up with all kinds of stuff when, in, you know, in this scenario that Lucy's describing where Labour um, you know, is, is in government and is administering the final stages of Brexit and um, it's uh, you know uh, <coughs> middle class anti Brexit base is it's having some sense of it's not uh, it there will be all kinds of um, ways in which they could ideologically justify that to themselves. Mm -hmm. um, well yeah, I mean I could imagine them sort of saying that they would you know accept Jeremy Corbyn's point of view that we have to, you know, uh, that that you know Observe the democratic thing as it's happened, and therefore we just, have to, despite the fact that we think it's not good, we have to do it. Um, or I, I don't know. I, I'm skeptical that they will accept that because I think that it's the same thing with people, and you see the same reaction if something does derail the Brexit as it's going along. With people who is kind of the Brexit groups, is there's a significant portion of the British population that basically had their vote uh, in June 2016. Hardwired in politically, like it's it's sort of strange that that seems to have happened. But I think something might be like, what do you mean? Sorry. like it's it's become you know if you think about how you know people's political views, people's political ideology, people to themselves as like you know oh I'm a socialist or I'm a liberal or I'm a conservative, and you, you have to give them you know, three words to describe their views. A lot of people have suddenly started using the Brexit vote one way or the other, and it's like become like a very clear cleavage in British politics and one that people adhere to very, very strongly. Um, 
which also means that there's very few people who change their minds. Um, there's like the whole thing of, you know, the Guardian likes to go and find people who say, oh, I voted leave and I regret it now. And they do exist and it's probably about, you know, half of them have been interviewed by the Guardian. <laughs> um, and so that is, you know, the, the, it's, it is a real problem. So I'm skeptical that people will be able to justify it to themselves if this, this data about, you know, the, the intense views on the Remain within the Labour Party membership is true. So. I have, I, well, I was thinking about last year's Labour Party conference and about bre like Brexit and this issue because I think that we saw a little bit of like a blip in terms of uh, the you know, the left itself is split with respect to Brexit, mm -hmm. you know, and we have a Brexit panel where, um, at this school, um, uh, I wasn't here yet, but you guys did a great job, but there we, we saw, like, there was someone who was kind of agnostic towards the question, there was someone who was for Remain, and there was someone who was for a left exit, um, and so I think at the Labour Party conference last year, we saw a blip in activity with respect to uh, you know, people on the hard left in the Labour Party protesting against the Labour Party at their conference on the issue of Brexit. And the way that they focused on it was about uh, equality and anti-racism, yeah. Um, and so it, it seems as though like it could just kind of like an Ouroboros, like eat it, continue to eat its uh, tail. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you could have like the um, the anti-Brexit left protesting against the like soft Brexit left, you know, in the leadership of the Labour Party, and that could just con and they could like you know give lip service to the anti-racism and equality and helping the you know impoverished neighborhoods and uh, you know metropolitan cities, et cetera, et cetera, and they can it could just kind of yeah it could not go on in this thing. I mean, <laughs> that's not a question. I think. That's a question that would make is up to the EU, ultimately, is how long are they going to let the UK, if it does fall into the sort of like endless loop and never getting resolved, how long is that going to be allowed to last? Um, and so the UK is told to shut up and stay or just is kicked out. Mm. Well, about I, the left. Yeah, the I think left. The, the loop is within the left. The, I mean, the left is the same kind of thing. It's, it's the Labour Party's. I mean, I think if, if Brexit gets resolved, they will get over it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, actually, I mean, they might not. They might not get over it. You may see then, like, immediately the hard left joining a campaign for the UK to rejoin the EU, mm -hmm. um, which I'm sure someone has already registered with the Electoral Commission and has bought URLs for and hired staff for. Like, that's going to happen. Um, and I think that may be where the hard left goes. And so left then becomes obsessed with this European question. It's sort of this like, it's, it's basically a constitutional issue. Ultimately, I'm very confused. You know, well, well, you were mentioning that society is split, like British society is split, split on the question, and then I need to bring it also to the left. Um, uh, in a way, I can't, I, I don't feel that, that, that like, the left is almost strong enough to build a kind of, I don't know, some kind of a coalition for, I don't know. Anything. Anything. Yeah. So there's a way in which, like, it, you know, it's kind of ideological weakness, or, you know, that this this idea of it just sort of justifying anything, and that, that you can find both Brexiteers and anti-Brexit. And I suppose the other thing I was thinking about was that our left Brexit person on the panel from Spike, um, like even spiked are quite soft on Corbyn and the Labour Party. Um, so yeah, it's kind of I don't know how active like you know it's non-members, members, whatever you know that so its supporters are within the Labour Party really. But um, uh, it's it's interesting that yeah you probably find people of both both stripes on the left within Labour. Um, uh, and in some in some way being swept along by whatever Labour has to do to kind of kick the can down the road. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so this uh, this kind of split um, in the left is over, let's say, identity politics, mm -hmm. right? and this neo-social democracy, something that we have dealt with a lot and, and is very prominent here and is also happening in the States with the SA um, and presumably elsewhere. Um, and yeah, one way in that which this plays out is through Brexit where um, the <coughs> neo-social democracy left um, are Corbyn bros or whatever. Um, uh, they actually, maybe Brexit is the opportunity to implement their policies um, that you know wouldn't pass under EU management, um, and then to the kind of identity politics left, Brexit is this kind of racist far right backlash that um, you know people of colour need to be protected from, and, and there's been all kinds of crazy stuff in Labour around um, like you know identity caucuses and. Um, white men not voting in Labour Party youth sections and stuff like that. Um, but you could, you could see that dynamic going on. But one of the things that um, in his article on the Sandinistas, uh, Chris Petro points out, was that, and this is back in late 2015, right, that Corbyn will save the Labour Party, not wreck it. Um, and obviously at the time it looked like Corbyn was going to wreck the Labour Party, that it was going to have um, <coughs> a potentially a worse election turnout than in 1931, all this kind of stuff. Um, the, one of the ways in which Corbyn is saving the Labour Party and not wrecking it is that this like tension between these two sides, this neo-social democracy and the identity politics, is actually like uh, constitutive. It it keeps people coming back for more um, because, of course, the problem isn't actually resolvable on its own terms. Um, and uh, in a way, what we might see is that even though events move on, um, this kind of like dynamic will will keep going as if things haven't changed and. And it will be many years down the line before the, the conversation on the left really changes. Um, but it will keep people voting Labour both ways, right? People are people are being told you need to vote Labour to um, have a you know a Brexit for workers' rights, and you need to vote Brexit to like stop the the nasty Tory racists. Um, and. Either way, whichever way you spin it, you still vote Labour at the end of the day. Mm. And that's kind of... So in the 60s, again, it didn't matter whether you were like, um, we need nuclear disarmament now, or um, <coughs> we need to, um, you know, um, uh, increase welfare spending. Um, like both ways you, you end up working for Labour. Do you think it, do you think it could would save I mean save the Labour Party another way? Would it you know, I suppose I I was just trying to think, okay, the mass people outside the Labour Party, the the masses, um, and where they where their support will go now, you know. Um, uh, and, you know, the effect of Labour administering Brexit. Well, I don't know. It's it, like, you know, in a, in a way, since Brexit has happened, we've seen the collapse of, like, of UKIP. Um, there was no, like, no, no need for it. Uh, in fact, I was listening back to um, uh, the, the Brexit panel we did, like, here, uh, and Jerry Downing had some prediction that like the UKIP thing was going to kind of like morph into fascism, basically. That the, the, the UKIP, but in fact, what we've seen is the opposite. We've just seen that UKIP has dissolved. Um, so, where does that support go? Like, where, like, do you, 
Yeah. I, it, you know, will it, will it make sense to call the Labour Party again a bourgeois workers' party? Will it be a workers' party again or not? Or was that? I don't know. Um. Well, I, mean, I yeah. Evan, do you want to? I was going to say that like there there is this like sort of strange reorientation in British politics that you can't kind of started, which is away from, I guess, like the old labor conservative split, um, like left, right, but it's not really a left mm -hmm. um, in the form of the labor party, towards one that's kind of based on like cultural issues and like cultural politics. Yeah. Um, like the, the best predictor of people's voting patterns in the British in the EU referendum was not, this is the British election, so we asked loads of people all these questions. They had, one of the questions was on what people think of the EU, and that did not predict their vote as well as a question on what their thoughts were on death penalty. Like it was, it was kind of this like conservative cultural values or liberal cultural values. Mm -hmm. It seems to be where the reorientation is taking place. So I think that like the idea the question of. question class per se. Yeah, class, class is abandoned entirely. So you can have a thing where you have. Labor is not a you know, workers' party of any sort. It doesn't have a class constituency of any kind. It just has a constituency based on like a loose collection of moral feelings. Well, the, I mean, the, to raise the um, specter of Adorno, who we read in the reading group this week, the, um, as much as the Labor Party is a workers' party, you know, Every party is a, mm. is a workers' party, <laughs> but the issue is really that they're them, they're it's mass society, right? Not class society. Yeah. Like what does that distinction mean? And that politics has become rackets. Right. Um, and the extent to which um, um, workers return to the Labour Party from the collapse of UKIP, um, it's, um, it's a racket. Can I say something about UKIP? Um, it's, I don't think it's only just that it's like cultural values, but I think the reason why UKIP was so successful is actually because of its early 90s conception of uh, trying to push for an independent democracy in the UK and to democratize the UK. <laughs> um, and that's like, so it, it's like, um, yeah, it is, it's rackets, but there's also this question of uh, democracy. democracy, yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, what about the early 90s? So what, what was that? What, what are you referring to there? Or? Well, right, like, it comes from like the Maastricht uh, Treaty, disagreements with the Maastricht Treaty, and also, I mean, it, UKIP actually comes from the Burgess Group. Um, and uh, which was influenced by Margaret Thatcher's Burgess speech, where she said, it's like, she was like, you know, this is the 300th anniversary of the uh, English Civil War, uh, and, or no, the Glorious Revolution. And so it's like, uh, so she was saying, the Burgess group was trying to uphold classical liberalism, um, and it's on that basis. I mean, even like, even still, UKIP has in their manifesto from that time that they want like, uh, you know, like community responsibility for, you know, uh, councils and stuff like that, you know, like community action and stuff. Um, and so people, you know, it's a, I think in a lot of ways, uh, the biggest success UKIP had was at the European elections, and that was a strategic focus, but um, a lot of their long-term membership was drawn to this broader question of democracy and um, mass participation, um, but I guess it, it's just again to I guess to bring bring things back to that question of democracy. Because they they flirted with um, like introducing more direct democracy to the UK, like mm -hmm. sort of on the model of a lot of American states or like Ireland having like a formal process for popular voting on certain issues, and there being some way of you know you get you get three hundred thousand people to sign a signature or to sign a petition. But to relate the two points, though, um, 
and and this this comes to the Labour Party and UKIP, which is that um, the way in which democracy um, kind of rears its head as an issue is um, because of uh, because politics and society appears to be corrupt rackets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we need a UK democracy. Why? Because the EU is corruption. Right, it's rackets. It's rackets. That's the argument. Um, okay. And why do we need um, democracy in the Labour Party? Because um, there's corruption. Um, it's uh, progress, right? The, the Blairite think tank inside Labour is, is a racket that like pumps people through to become MPs, and so we need deselection. Um, and it's the same with the kinds of um, democratic discontents on the right. You know, the, the people that have split from UKIP and formed for Britain want to do things like. Um, uh, they um, cut the pay of uh, local council CEOs who earn, you know, hundred thousand pounds plus a year. Um, they want to. They want to elect police officers because of their, you know, obsession with the Rochdale grooming gang cases in which the police uh, failed to act. They're like, well, we need to de deselect the police officers, the chief constables, right? So the um, democracy uh, mm -hmm. rears its head in, 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 this, in relation to that issue of like corruption and, mm -hmm. and rackets. And mass society, yeah. And, yeah, and, and the, you know, it, it doesn't mass society. The question is whether those kinds of demands for democracy can be, um, can lead to a, a class consciousness. Hmm. Well, since the 1970s, there's been a fascinating phenomenon in British politics, which is a substantial number of people who are swing voters between the Liberals and the Liberal Democrats, and then whatever the far-right party of the moment is, or the most right-wing party of the moment is. So people in the 70s who were torn between the Liberals and the National Front, and then in the 90s, they were torn between the Liberal Democrats and the BNP, and then in 2010, they were flipping between Liberal Democrats and UKIP. And so there's quite a few people who voted Liberal Democrat in 2010, voted UK in 2015, and it's all in the city of rackets because they're looking at those parties and thinking, you know, and also because of how these parties present themselves, making the assumption that this is going to be the most democratic thing, this is the best odds of overcoming that racket. Mm -hmm. And that has been a phenomenon that seems to baffle a lot of political scientists who've looked at it because for, you know, the conception of bourgeois political sociology, they can't understand why someone would be to try to choose between the Liberals and the National Front, but the conception of politics is rackets. So it becomes very obvious why someone is trying to choose between the Liberals and the National Front. You also get so, uh, lot, uh, the yeah, Remainers who are now, well, it's in, mm, it's weird, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I was just talking to a member of my family the other day, <laughs> again, about Brexit, because it's, you know, it divides families, and uh, so, uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, now she's um, she's 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 moved. She's German. Uh, she's my dad's partner. And she's she's moved from uh, supporting Merkel CDU in the in 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 um, Germany to considering supporting the Green Party. So it's like yeah, it's just a bit depressing. But I, I don't know. I don't know what the that's Green Party here. Yeah, the Green Party here. Uh, a bit, but but also that I guess like. She's she's come around to a more social democratic perspective, but just reminded me also of what you were saying earlier that you know she, that about the death of ideology. She's like very much like no no to ideology, and I sort of make this argument that well that's also an ideology to be anti ideological, and she just won't accept it. <laughs> I mean, the, the Greens are red Tories who drive electric cars. Red Tories who drive electric cars. That that is my conception of the Green Party. <laughs> If I, if I was an electoral strategist for the Greens, I would be going after like, you know, the kind of people people who voted for David Cameron, who voted like Theresa May. That yeah. would be who I would be targeting if I was doing the Greens electoral strategy. Yeah, okay. hmm. What were the concerns? There's um, 
Right, well, it, it is interesting uh, in Parliament the um, arguments, the actual, I mean, this is the Parliamentary Labour Party, so it, it's not specifically the left, but there are obviously um, MPs in the Labour Party, particularly new ones who claim to be the kind of outcome of momentum. Um, people like Alex Sobel from Leeds, an MP who was interviewed in Jacobin magazine about you know, his being on the Labour left. Um, people like um, oh God, what's her name? Laura Pidcock, um, the MP for Durham. Um, you know how how they're what they're doing in Parliament, what they what their kind of arguments are. And they that often their arguments against the Tories are um, are uh, anti ideology, right? The Tories are being ideological about Brexit, and we need to act in the national interest, right? So, you know, um, the Tories have gone on, they, they've got this kind of line that the Tories have gone on this ideological, racist, right-wing turn um, because they want to capture the UKIP vote or whatever. And actually what we need is um, sensible national government to um, make sure that we don't kind of drive Bre drive Britain off the cliff with a with a hard Brexit. Um, so you get one of the other interesting ones is with the uh, Windrush scandal, right? They there are two arguments that they put out at the same time that are in one sense incompatible, but like uh, really get at this kind of um, this ideological mishmash. On the one hand, the problem is that the Tories are racists and they had an explicit policy of, um, what's the word, dangerous environment or hostile environment. Hostile environment, right, against, like, Im against immigrants. On the other hand, they argue that the problem is cuts in the Home Office and there weren't enough staff in place to deal with the processing of cases, and therefore people got lost. And so it's an issue of, like, austerity. Um, and obviously the two arguments are kind of in conflict. If, if their home office had been properly staffed, the, uh, they would have just deported more people, uh, <laughs> more efficiently. Uh, uh, anyway, so, mm. the, because what is gonna happen is that a lot of the people who are now in youth momentum, uh, joining the Labour Party, getting involved and getting excited, are gonna become A, local councillors, that's already happening, and then they're going to be MPs. And, you know, 10 years down the line, we're going to be talking about mainstream Labour MPs who, in yeah, their radical MPs. youth, we were momentum activists. And, Massive Corbynism. Right, yeah. acid Corbynism, well, but now we're like serious. Well, it's like New Labour, how basically everyone in New Labour was either a Trotskyist or a communist, including Tony Blair. Uh, Tony Blair was apparently only for six weeks because a girl he liked was reading Trotsky. Mm -hmm. And but, he didn't have now. He didn't inhale, yeah. <laughs> but you know, people like Jack Straw was like young communist league. A lot of people were like Trotskyists of various kinds, and it'll be just new labor all over again. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what country they'll be. I, I think like we only have a few minutes left, but I wanted to jump on that the point that Afron was making and pose a question to you, mm -hmm. uh, which is what is the relationship then between ideology and freedom? It's really thought for this point earlier about like th what's missing today is maybe this question of freedom, what's lost, like this historical pursuit of freedom. And so then my question is like, you know, we've been looking at ideologically, there's all these kinds of like things like democracy or the nation or internationalism. Um, like how, like, so how do these things relate then to the pursuit of freedom at the level of ideology for the left? It's <laughs> a hard question. Um, I think they sort of relate to ideology as ideology is a, you know, it, it is a means to an end, the end being freedom in some ways. Um, I, I think that like the ideology of, I don't think you can have an ideology of freedom. Um, I mean, you kind of do have that with like libertarians in the United States, but it just ends up being very bizarre and contradictory and very unfair. 
free. Um, so I think the relationship of ideology and freedom is ideology is a method of achieving freedom or attempting to move society towards freedom. Um, if that is at all what you're going to get at, I'm not sure. But freedom is ideological. How do you mean? Well, either one is kind of uh, committed to the idea of freedom. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, you know, or one is, uh, decides that it's no longer important, or no longer desirable. Sure, but then I think that your ideology is built around that question, that that is what informs ideology, is like freedom. You can, you can be, you can have ideological support or opposition to or ambivalence about freedom, but then that would then inform ideology as a method of, particularly if you are trying to achieve freedom. Freedom is bourgeois ideology. Yeah. As a, you know, freedom per se. Mm -hmm. Well, to, to kind of tie, tie the point back around, we, Evan, in your presentation, talks about um, state capitalism and Bonapartism and the kind of, one of the ways in which the Labour Party falls below the threshold of um, socialists, even non-Marxist socialists of the early 19th century, is um, in uh, this, you know, thinking of the, the need for the state to manage the contradictions of society. Um, and so in that sense, as you said in the presentation, it's a, it's a Bonapartist party. Um, and the issue of freedom really is um, a, you know, the as we inherit it from the bourgeois revolutions and the bourgeois ideals of a self-regulating society, um, and so it kind of brings us back around to this issue of the state and civil society, um, and uh, I think that's that really is the framework. All the kind of things we discussed about, you know. Communitarianism, municipal socialism, reforms, nationalisation um, are um, uh, unselfconscious ways of, of dealing with that. Dealing with that problem. I mean, in a sense, you could also say it's not just the Labour, but like all the, all the political parties are, mm -hmm. you know, have fallen below that. Although, I guess one could, you know, there might be a point of kind of recognising that, you know, there are instances where labour falls below, many instances where labour falls below, like, the Conservative Party in terms of advocating for freedom. In reality, like, I don't think any of the parties, like, really could uphold, uphold I, the idea of ideolo ideology, uh, ideologically advocating for now, I think in some ways it's almost more disappointing that on the Labour Party, given that they do describe themselves as a um, <coughs> as a socialist party, um, and that they you know, have an ideology, so to speak. Um, whereas you know, the, the Conservatives managed to have gotten on fine with that one for 300 odd years. Um, so it is more disappointing that Labour just Do you have any other conditions? No, I think I'll end on that note.